Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Solny Adel Stenson, and I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth installment of our Tyson Summer Seminar series online. For those of you who haven't joined us before, I'd just like to point out that we try to create an interactive space using the YouTube chat box, which should appear either to the right or directly below this video on your screen. Feel free to write in there to introduce yourself and share where you're tuning in from. During the seminar, please use the chat to, to ask any questions about the research being presented. You may leave your questions there at any time during the talk and we will gather them at the end for our Q&A session. Today, I'm honored to introduce our seminar speaker, Dr. Samnika Halsey, who is an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources at University of Missouri. Dr. Halsey earned her bachelor's degree at Northeastern Illinois University and her master's degree from Chicago State University, where she worked on the management and restoration of the federally threatened pitcher's thistle plant. From there, Dr. Halsey went on to earn her PhD in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where her research focused on advancing our understanding of the mechanisms involved in the ecology of Lyme disease. To do this, she used quantitative reviews and built spatially explicit models of tick pathogen and host interactions. Now at University of Missouri, Dr. Halsey and her lab group, the Halsey Applied Computational Ecology Lab, work on improving overall ecosystem health using computational approaches to understand mechanisms underlying the patterns we see in nature. Broadly speaking, they focus on biodiversity conservation and emerging diseases across a hierarchy of spatial and temporal scales. We're thrilled to have Dr. Halsey join us today and share more about her research. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Halsey for her talk entitled, Understanding Disease Emergence Patterns by Combining Long-Term Data Sets and Computational Approaches. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna repeat the title because uh, Sony already said it, but so one of the things, we're gonna start our talk by talking about why long-term data sets are important. When we tend to look at data sets, we, a lot of times, uh, if we go out into the field, we might only get a snapshot of data. So for example, if we were to look at the data for the climate from like 1950 to 1980, we would see that the temperature, the overall de temperature has been declining. Whereas if we looked at a different snapshot from maybe the 1960s to 1980, we will see that temperature has been increasing. However, by looking at a long-term scale, we can see that the overall trend in temperature has increased. So recently in ecology, there is an upsurge in the interest of long-term data sets. And the reason this is because there, we have improved our computational power that allows us to utilize these larger data sets effectively. So we have increased our memory, our RAM, just overall computing power. So what can we use long-term data sets for? So Dr. Son Dr. Alderson said that I have worked on searching and pitch uh, for my master's degree, but I also have worked on the ecology of Lyme disease for my PhD. And this is the research that I'm gonna talk with you today. So the focus of my research has mainly been on the black-legged tick. And we can see that the distribution of the black-legged tick is throughout the entire Eastern United States. So through the Midwest, the Northeast and the Southern states. And the black-legged tick can transmit a host of diseases. Of these diseases, we have anaplasmosis, babiosis, uriculosis, as well as Lyme disease. And then of course, I'm focusing on Lyme disease. So in order for us to understand the ecology of Lyme disease, we have to learn, know the past. So we need to look at past data. And to do this, we can look at animal captures. So when people actually go out, capture mammals and check them for ticks as well as check them for pathogens, or we can conduct tick drags where we take a one by one meter square cloth and drag it along the vegetation to pick up any questing ticks. 
my research has primarily focused on animal captures, where for my first chapter of my dissertation, I connected a meta-analysis that looked at 116 articles from 1970 to 2017. And from this, we captured, we pulled out data from almost 190,000 individual animals. There were 112 bird species, 43 mammal species, and then 12 reptile species. Um, this is a map of this meta-analysis to show you where these animal captures came from. So from this, we can see that research has not been conducted on or published equally across the distribution of the black-legged tick in the United States. We can see that most of the research has been conducted in areas with high prevalence of Lyme disease, so in the Midwest and the Northeast, whereas in the South, the prevalence of Lyme disease has not been as high and consequently we don't have much research on the black legged tick. So when we look at that data, it's typically hard to infer much when there are clear biases and data collection. So from this, we can see that there's three times as many studies in the Northeast than the South. There are 62% more hosts that were captured in the Northeast and the Midwest, and that there are 95% more hosts captured in the Northeast than the South. So when we think about this, and sorry, I can't remember. Oh, sorry, I had to remember where my slides went. So before I go to my next data, I want to talk about um, two metrics that we're gonna talk about. The first is the prevalence of infestation. So the prevalence of infestation is defined as the number of individual hosts that are infested by ticks divided by the total number of individual hosts examined. So let's say we examine 50 tick, 50 hosts, and 25 of them are infested by ticks, we would say the prevalence is 50%. The next metric we're going to talk about is intensity of infestation. So this is the total number of ticks divided by the total number of individual hosts infested. So let's say we had a hundred ticks total pulled out of that 25 ticks, then we can say the intensity of infestation would be hundred divided by 25, so four. So when we think about that, I wanted to know which species were the most commonly infested ticks. So what I did was I went through those 116 mammal, captured, mammal species captured, and I pulled out the host that 50% of the time they were infested by larvae. So for this, we found that there were 16 species of wildlife hosts that were infested at least 50% of the time. We can see from the left-hand side, so from on the x-axis, that white-footed mice were most heavily sampled, so about 18,000, and this is for the north east that there were um, many other species that have ticks and we also need a better sampling effort. So now I'm going to show the data from each of the three regions. So for the northeast we can see that even though white-footed mice had the most sampling there are some other species that actually host more ticks. For the Midwest, we can see that we need to sample more wildlife hosts in the Midwest. There are about only five of those most commonly infested wildlife hosts that were captured and sampled in the Midwest. And then if we look for the South, we also see that there are only four of the most commonly um, infested hosts that were captured and examined, two of which they were captured and examined, but they didn't have any larvae species. And this might just be because there are fewer reported cases of Lyme disease. So with this data, I wanted to see if there was any differences in the prevalence and intensity of the ticks on wildlife hosts. So for this data set, we're looking at all hosts, if there are any differences between the different regions. So I'm looking at the larvae, we have the larvae tick, the nymph tick, and the adult life stages. So we can see that there was no differences in the prevalence of the tick on wildlife hosts between the north east and the Midwest for both the larvae and the nymph ticks, but for the adult ticks, there's twice as many adults on hosts in the Northeast than the Midwest. What about if we wanna see if there's differences over time? So remember, I'm looking at the data from 1970 through 2017. So how has the prevalence changed over time? We can see that 
the prevalence has actually increased in the Northeast, whereas it's been decreasing in the Midwest. And I'm not showing data for the Southeast because we just didn't have enough data to look at this. So when we think about what the future has in store, it says that we have twice as many adult ticks in the Northeast and it's increasing over time. So that's one thing to be concerned about that we could possibly uh, have management efforts to target. So how about these ticks and they have the potential to uh, be infected with Borrelia. So are there any difference in the prevalence of Borrelia on those uh, ticks that are feeding? So we can look between these cases and we can say that, see that there's no real differences between um, the Midwest and the Northeast, but in the Northeast it's about 11 times as many infected ticks um, in the Northeast and the South. And then when we look at adult ticks, we can see that there are about five times as many infected adult ticks in the Midwest than the Northeast, but there's no differences in adult tick infestation, um, infection between the Northeast and the South. So what about over time? We can see that for the most part, the prevalence of Borrelia has been similar over time, except that it has been decreasing in adult ticks in the Northeast. So I previously was talking about the um, changes in the prevalence of Borrelia and ticks in all hosts, but now I wanna kind of dial that into two main species. So the two species that we have the most data on. So the first one is the white-footed mouse. This mouse is ubiquitous as well as highly competent and highly permissive for both the tick and the pathogen. And of those 187,000 individual animal captures, the white-footed mouse made up 50% of the data set. The white-tailed deer made up 40% of our data set, and this is important for the reproduction of the adult tick. And then the other 10% was the other 165 species. So from this, I was able to utilize this data to see if there was any differences in the intensity of tick infestation for the larvae and the nymphs on white-footed mice, and then for the adult ticks on deer. And when we look between the regions, we see that there's no difference between the Northeast and the Midwest, but for, for the larvae, but for the nymphs, there are twice as many ticks on white-footed mice in the Northeast than the Midwest. And then for white-footed, um, for white-tailed deer, there are three times as many ticks on white-tailed deer in the Northeast and the Midwest. How about over time? We can see that for the larvae, there really is no change. We have an increase over time in the Midwest and there is no change for adult ticks in either regions. So when we think about what the future has in store, we can see that there is, um, since there are, even though in the Northeast, there are twice as many ticks on mice um, Nephil ticks on mice, it is increasing in the Midwest, so maybe in the future we might see more ticks on mice, nymphal ticks on mice. So even though I presented some of this data, it's hard to infer much when there are clear biases in the data. So we do can see that the prevalence of Borrelia is higher in the Northeast and it's increasing with time. But we know that we need to sample more non-mice hosts. Um, most work on species has been those that amplify the pathogen, but not those that reduce the pathogen in the environment. And we definitely need more research in the southeastern US. And this is likely because there are fewer reported cases of Lyme disease, but by having more research um, in the southeast, we can better understand why there are fewer cases of Lyme disease. So let's now talk about a little bit of my modeling efforts. So to understand, to reduce Lyme disease, it requires us understanding the interactions between the tick, the pathogen, and wildlife hosts. So just a little bit about the life cycle. We have an adult tick. It lays eggs in the spring. Those um, eggs become larvae, and they feed on a variety, variety of hosts in the summer. Then they overwinter and become nymphs. They then feed in the spring on the same subset of hosts. 
and then they transition to adults. And then in the adults, they feed on white-tailed deer in the fall, and then the cycle starts over again. So they tend to have a two-year uh, life cycle. So I built a spatially explicit um, individual based tick interaction model that was temperature dependent. It had different tick attachment rates. It included host grooming, molting rates, and the hosts had their home ranges. And it also had stage specific tick survival rates. Some of the things that it did not include was territoriality between the host species. It did not include partial feedings of the ticks. And then I did not include fluctuation um, host populations. But I did parameterize and calibrate this model against real world data. So one of the questions I wanted to ask with this model was, can modeling help determine which management strategy most effectively reduces tick populations? So I use that individual based modeling, it's a bottom up approach. And for this model, you set the rules for the individuals to examine emergent behavior. And because of this, you can experimentally manipulate multiple scenarios to uh, get different outcomes. And it is important to remember that a model is a purposeful representation of a real system. So I only include the aspects of the model that I needed to represent the system. So using what we know about host tick interaction, can we help inform future management actions? So there have been varying results in the efforts to reduce tick populations, things such as deer culling, bait boxes, exclusions, even fire to control the vegetation and spraying. So what I wanted to do was to target on host ticks in my models for 10 years to see which management strategy would be best. So overall, I found that multiple management actions are necessary and they need to be enacted long term for changes to occur via on host strategies. So when I looked at the, when I targeted the on host ticks for the mice, so these are the larvae and the nymphs, I found that increasing mice grooming decreases tick populations in the short term, but overall, um, by year 10, we didn't see as much as a difference in those NIP and adult um, larvae and the NIP populations. Whereas if we look at the deer by increasing deer grooming, it actually increases the tick populations in the long term. So in years one to five, and years one, we don't really see too much of a impact, but by years five and 10, we will see a decrease. But one thing about this model is the model, even though it led to decreases, regardless, over time in the model, the tick population, populations tended to increase. So by it decreasing the populations, it led to a decrease in what would have occurred if there was no management actions. So let's go back to this model and we're gonna to go to the last part of my talk where I'm gonna talk about um, adding new species and testing dilution effect. No, sorry, that's not what we're gonna do. Um, before we get to that, um, let's talk about uh, just some aspects of this model. So in for tick ecology, the larvae tend to hatch uninfected from the edge and then they will acquire the bacteria either through feeding on the host. So the most epidemiologic significant stage could either be the nymphs or they can be the adult stage. But when we look at the size of these ticks, nymphs tend to be much smaller than adults. So when they feed on humans, we are less likely to, to notice them feeding on us. So then they're most likely to go undetected and infect us with the pathogen. So we tend to think of the most epidemiologic stage as the nymphs. So there are three measurements for this. One of being the density of nymphs, so the total number of nymphs in the population, the density of infected nymphs, and then the nymph infection prevalence, so the percentage of nymphs that are infected. And different studies publish different metrics, and there's a little bit of debate on which ones are the most um, important. So when I decided to test the dilution effects, I decided to look at all three of these to see which ones were the most important or how the mechanisms and hypotheses affected each. 
So let me talk a little bit about the dilution effect hypothesis. So it is widely recognized that host diversity affects disease risk, and it can do so in one of two ways. It can decrease risk, which is known as the dilution effect, where by increasing host diversity, you decrease pathogen prevalence, but it can also increase risk. So increasing host diversity will increase pathogen prevalence. So we know that this tick species can feed on a wide variety of mammals and bird species, which all have varying reservoir competencies for the bacteria and host permissiveness for the tick. So in this model, I decided to add four additional um, host species in addition to the mice and the deer, which is the chipmunk, the shrew, the squirrel, and the possum. So um, I'm gonna talk about three of the dilution effect mechanisms, the first being vector regulation. So this mechanism is where added species that are poor quality hosts result in low survival of the vector. So in order to test this, I am basically looking at the density of NIPs. And then I actually tested um, as metrics of biodiversity, uh, I looked at host abundance, host richness, and then host diversity. And host abundance was actually the best supporting model. And what this showed was that increased host abundance decreased the number of ticks in the population. Because as we increased host abundance, we had more of those ticks that are low, um, more of those hosts that are low permissive for the ticks such as the possum and the squirrels. The next mechanism is transmission regulation. So this mechanism is that added species reduce the probability that contact between individuals leads to pathogen transmission. So again, I looked at three different models. So I looked at the species richness, the host abundance and species diversity. And then on the y-axis is the density of infected NIPs. So this is a measurement of the pathogen transmission. And what I found was that increased species richness reduced pathogen transmissions to NIPs in terms of the density of infected NIPs. But if we were to look at it from the standpoint of NIP infected prevalence, we can see that increased, um, that host abundance was the best model and that increased pathogen transmission in the terms of NIP infection prevalence. And this might be why different papers on the dilution effect, depending on whether they present the work of the density of infected NIPs or the NIP infection prevalence, they have different uh, outcomes. So the last mechanism is encounter reduction. So this is where added species reduce pathogen transmission by reducing vector encounters with the reservoir host the most supporting model was host abundance. And then from this, we looked at the density of infected NIPs that were fed by mice. So we are considering the mice to be that reservoir host for the pathogen and seeing whether added species will reduce pathogen transmission. And from this, we can see that higher host abundance results in more infective NIPs that are fed by mice as larvae. So Yes, increasing host abundance will mean that more NIPs are infected that were fed by mice. So host abundance seems to be the most important predictor of human disease risk. But this is, and this is with the assumption that increasing host abundance increases hosts that are not competent for the pathogen as well as not permissive for the tick. And there are multiple mechanisms that seem to be at work but this also depends on the metric of disease risk. So species richness decreases the density of infected NIMPs, but host abundance increases the NIMPO infection prevalence. So this work was, I have a lots of different acknowledgement for this work um, that I did during my PhD. And now I wanna talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing now as an assistant professor. So let's go back to that, uh, that the figure that I showed about the meta-analysis for uh, the animal captures in the US. So if we look right here, we can see that there was only one paper that was published in Missouri where they captured mammals. And this was actually on black bears. 
So for that, um, it's just lucky that I happen to get a position at the University of Missouri. Um, and this is the work that I'm doing. So now I hope to contribute more data to this, to learning more about the ecology of Lyme disease in Missouri. So I am working at several different sites this year and hopefully continue. So I'm collecting data at Prairie Fork, at Tucker Prairie, and then also at Tyson Research Center. And the hope is to design a long-term multi-site ecological study that surveils and catalogs the vertebrate, invertebrate, and pathogen communities, and to do this across different landscape types in central uh, Missouri using standard collection methods, and then to use this data to help refine my models at, and the, for them to be aimed at reducing tick-borne disease risk in central Missouri. So my last slide is just some pictures from field work for the last couple of weeks, um, collecting data in the summer. And that's it. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Halsey. Um, we'll give it a few minutes for, for questions to roll in on the YouTube chat, but we have a couple that we can get started with. Okay. Uh, so the first one I have is, uh, what role does the apparent population genetic structure of Ixodes scapularis among the three regions in the first part of your talk? Mm -hmm. um, what role, how does that influence differences in prevalence of Borrelia burgdorferi in the... Oh, genetics. Um, <laughs> so I'm not much of a genetics person, but I do know a little bit. Um, so I know that different, there's basically like two, I guess, not subspecies, but like the, the ticks interact differently in the Northeast and the Northwest. So like in the South, in the South, like the South, they tend to not quest as high. They tend to uh, feed more on road, um, lizards, reptiles, which tend to be uh, not really competent, even in, even though this is research that's in California, where they've actually found that there's some lizards that will actually uh, clear the ticks from infection. So that could be um, that, but I'm not really much, I don't know much about the genetics. That's definitely something that could probably be incorporated into the models um, by having more data. Unfortunately, I could only use the data that is in the literature and it's very, one of the reasons why I wanted to try to collect my own data and have standardized collection methods is to make sure I have all the data that I need to build a model that can be a little bit more realistic um, to a specific site. But that would probably involve me having to, to, to incorporate genetics. I would need to, um, I got an A in genetics, but I'm not really a genetic person. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> I'm sorry. Actually, that leads me into um, my next question, which was about, you know, from being a, a modeler, from the modeler's perspective, um, what kinds of qualities of data or types of data would you like to have in an, in an ideal world? Um, are there specific parameters that you often wish that people would have measured when they're out doing field work in this system? Yes. So um, if I, I, I strongly believe like if you, when you're publishing a paper to, if you're publishing percentages, also publish the total number that the percentages are out of. That way we can calculate, you know, percentage, the, the logistic, the zeros and the ones. So we know it's 53% is infected, but we don't know what's the total number of ticks versus that, or um, giving a description of the sites that you, because I would love to incorporate. So even though, so my model is spatially explicit, but it just assumes a homogeneous forest cover, um, but I would love to do it in different types. So prairie versus forest. So if you could give a description of the, the ecology of the background of the site, a little bit of that, so we can know what that data is correlated to. Um, effort of sampling. So like for me this year, I'm doing two day sampling efforts. Um, so for animal captures and then the tick drags are um, 
100 meter transect. So if we, we might know how many total ticks you drag, but what's the what's what's the sampling effort? How many times did you go out? So would want to be able to calculate. So I, I talked about me using the animal capture data. I did pull out tick drag data, but that has been a little bit more difficult to develop a meta-analysis because it's hard to compare between studies when they did different methods. Um, some of them might have, you know, dragged for, uh, they might have presented it in meters. So how far they did, some of them did it in person hours or person time. So just trying to be kind of consistent. And even if you don't report all the, I think it's really important to, even if you don't report the data in your paper to have it somewhere. So when a modeler sends you an email, say, hey, do you happen to have the raw data? You do. So you can, <laughs> can you, so you can send it to them. Um, that would be great. Great, thanks. That's something everyone should hear. <laughs> um, okay, another question is, maybe it's too early, but are you able to tell us anything about your preliminary tick numbers so far this year in terms of the number of Amblyomma americanum or Lone Star tick versus Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged tick? Um, so I don't have the numbers, but we've definitely caught way more Lone Star ticks um, than uh, Ixodes um, or the dog tick. Um, we've caught, interesting enough, we, so we're gonna actually compare. Um, so all of my ticks, we wear white suits and we catch way more ticks on us than the tick drags. So we actually take off um, for each plot, they remove all the ticks on person. So we're gonna compare whether or not there are different tick species that are caught on person versus tick drags. Uh, but I don't have that data yet. I just know that we've caught about over the last four weeks, almost 150 mammals, but we haven't, um, my, my ticks are, they're identifying the ticks, but they, they haven't yet. <laughs> they're supposed to be identifying them, but I checked the data sheet yesterday and there's only two entries when they should be way more than that. So <laughs> I know how it is when you get busy with the field season. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, another question we had in here is, do some species of ticks carry and transfer diseases more than others? Yes, I know the answer is yes. I don't know which uh, which ones um, there are, and that just like just like some animals are more competent for um, the pathogens. So some ticks they do have different. It, it depends on is 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 more likely depending on who they feed on and they happen to feed on. So like one of the reasons the black legged tick is tends to be the most important tick for humans is it, it's the one that's more likely to bite humans. So there's other ticks that carry Borrelia, but because they don't um, bite humans, we don't necessarily worry about them. So they're known as cryptic vectors. So they transmit it throughout the, the environment, but not at our stage. So that's why we tend to be focused more on reducing the black-legged tick than the other ticks. Thanks. Okay, uh, the next question concerns the dilution effect. Uh, do you find that the spatial scale of the study, for example, small patches versus large patches, affects the direction of the relationship between host diversity and Lyme risk to humans? I, I, I definitely think it does. Um, I didn't do, so my model was just a, um, it had a, it was a fixed scale, but because different hosts have different home range sizes, um, that will drastically affect where they go and how much of an impact. So like in my model, the possums, uh, they had a really strong dilution effect because they were pretty much to go anywhere in that area because it wasn't, it didn't cover their entire home age. But if I had a larger model that they were maybe only in certain aspects, then I would expect that overall the dilution effect wouldn't have been as strong. And that's actually something that I hope to do I actually, 
Um, I've been working on translating my model into Python, which will allow me to run it on a cluster and kind of, because my mo the model takes a long time to run, like it took, um, and I want to be able to increase the spatial and the temporal scale, so that would require me to use more computational power, but the, 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 the platform that I originally built the model is not power enough for that, so I had to switch it to a different, a different platform that will allow me to actually break it apart to run different sections so it can not take the years to run. So I do hope to eventually increase the spatial and the temporal scale of this model. Thanks. Okay, uh, the next question is regarding your meta-analysis that um, the mm -hmm. picture included reptiles as tick hosts. Yes. And they're wondering, um, do reptiles just play a role in the tick life cycle or do they play roles in disease transmission as well? So there has been studies um, from in the, on the West Coast that reptiles can clear the infection from a tick. So like if an infected larvae feeds on a reptile species when it translates, when it, when it, when it, uh, when it molts into a nymph, it's no longer infected. Usually when a tick gets infected, it stays infected for the rest of its life, but it can actually clear the infection. So they do have a lower competency than some of the mammal species, but they can also maybe, I don't know the mechanisms through which it works, but they can reduce overall tick, or not tick abundance, but um, pathogen prevalence. Thanks. Okay, and then we have some, um general comments and consensus about your earlier description of, of metadata and people loving metadata in the comments. <laughs> um, next we have, how does the data collected help researchers with tick related diseases? And perhaps this is um, related to the data that you're collecting now. Um, so right now I am, so how does it, so not only am I collecting uh, so I'm not trying to like target a specific tick species. So I'm basically collecting all the ticks and then we're taking tissue. Um, we started to try to do blood samples, but blood samples is not really that easy to get from all the mammals. So we just kind of like decided after the first week to scrap that. But the plan is to kind of build a database of having the ticks and the pathogens because their tick tick-borne diseases are increasing across the U.S. Um, they are moving south from the, from like Borrelia, Lyme disease is moving south from the Northeast. Um, Missouri has been like a hot spot for two viruses, so Heartland virus and Berlin virus. So the hope is by building a long-term data set, we can, even if we're, we can kind of have like a repository of data so we, that we can go back in, check to see when a new pathogen might, when, when we might see a pathogen emerge, we can try to figure out, was it here? When did it get here? Um, what type of environment is in? So hopefully, so not just to uh, test just for one specific pathogen, but to try to make it, I, my hope is for like my lab to be um, not just focused on Lyme disease, but to be just like tick-borne diseases, ticks, just everything. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm t I tend to be a data person, not a Pacific species person. Great, thanks. Okay, the next question uh, is about hosts. Uh, mm -hmm. Do any hosts reduce or change the size of their home range based on tick burden or more broadly, oh. how does tick burden influence host movement? I have no clue. Um, I am working on a project looking at zoonotic diseases and animal welfare. We're gonna try to see if um, whether or not basically ticks or zoonotic diseases affect the physiology of some hosts. And it could be if tick burdens, um, we, we tend to assume that zoonotic diseases don't have an effect on the reservoir host, but they might maybe have like a smaller um, decrease in functionality, reproduction or whatnot. And it could possibly decrease home range, but we don't really know. We tend, it's, it's interesting as humans, we tend to think about the things that affect us and not necessarily the mammal species. So I'm trying to like look at zoonotic diseases from the other side to hopefully maybe better inform models because if it does alter behavior 
or home range sizes, then that's important to know. Thanks. Okay, the, the next question is, are you collaborating with other labs slash groups to compare tick data across the country? Um, across the country, that would be the hope to eventually get like a standardized collection methods. Um, I am in the process of collaborating with Sony and several people at Tyson. And then there's some people in the vet med school at Mizzou. Um, unfortunately, I've only been a professor for eight months. So I'm still in the process of building those collaborations. So if I don't know who this person is, but if you wanna collaborate, I'm all for it. <laughs> Nice. Um, I had another question that this is just me wondering, seeing the skunk on your final slide here, wondering how that went. Oh, you didn't see the Twitter thread. Um, <laughs> so we caught three skunks um, in one day. They, they, they got into our tomahawk traps and we tried to, um, well, I did it because my texts were like, no way. Um, so we did process one, it did spray the cover that it was in and we just decided. So then I made the executive decision to let the other two go and not try those. And it did result in a couple of baking soda baths and hydrogen peroxide to get the smell out. But, um, now our protocol is if we catch any skunks, just to let them go immediately. Cause I don't know how to process them without them spraying. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I, that looks like all the questions that um, we have. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, if this were in person, you would hear the roaring applause right now, but hopefully we can make that happen at some point in the future. Yeah, hopefully I have like more data, uh, actual data from Central Missouri and not just my dissertation stuff. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fantastic. We'd love to have you back. So thank you again, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us for, for the live stream. And um, we'll, we'll see you next week. All right, we're, are we no longer streaming now? I don't know. I think, oh, I thought Beth was back. Sorry, trying to get back. I'm ending it now. I was waiting for the delay. Hold on. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be on there. Are we no longer streaming? I know, right? <laughs> Don't worry, I can edit it out. <laughs>